Today's video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community of people who've come together to help each other take their next step in their creative journey. Everything from cooking to animation, music, self-care, how to start and run small businesses. There's not only something here for everybody, but you'll be surprised how nuanced things can get and how interconnected all this can be. Trust me, no matter the path you go down, you'll find yourself surprised at what you may need to learn to accomplish your goals and Skillshare has all your bases covered. It's easy to navigate. Classes usually run less than an hour, but you can always stop and pick back up at any time. This is all online after all, so it goes at your pace and follows your schedule. And it doesn't bog you down with ads. It caters to all skill levels, so if you just want to dabble or you want to hone your mastered abilities or anywhere in between, Skillshare is a resource you should not pass up. And I do love to give recommendations whenever they pop up on my channel, so today I'd like to recommend Productivity for Creatives. Build a system that brings out your best with Thomas Frank. I cannot stress the importance of schedules and keeping yourself on task. That's what this class is all about. It helps you manage both your creativity and your business. These are skills you will need at every point in your career as a content creator. And if nothing else, this is going to help you out in life in general. And if this all sounds good, there's a link below that's going to get you Skillshare Premium completely free for an entire month. But keep in mind, this is only good for the first thousand people that sign up. But yes, thank you again to Skillshare. And let's start the video. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. I know we've done a lot of these as of recently, but bear with me, I will be talking about video games again very soon. And truth be told, even within Sonic Speed Reading, I was planning on taking a bit of a break from IDW coverage. I felt like it was a good time to jump over to older stuff before we explored Evan Stanley's current run or follow up with any of the loose threads from Ian Flynn's stories, but I posted a poll for my patrons and they made it loud and clear. We need to take a look at the 30th anniversary comic IDW dropped back in July of this this year. And since the free comic book day extra story has hit store shelves, now's as good a time as any to take a look at that as well. Now, generally, I don't like wasting my time on one-off comics. Team Sonic Racing got a tie-in comic, but I don't know about you. I don't really need to waste my time with 20 plus pages advertising an OK Kart Racer. But what makes this one interesting is that it's the first time we've seen classic Sonic under IDW's publication. And truth be told, I wasn't expecting a whole lot from this. I did expect something along the lines of Archie's Mega Drive miniseries, which is a lot of fun. And if you're familiar with that book, this might not seem so different at first. Under the right circumstances, this could be considered a continuation of Mega Drive if you just didn't pay attention to the publication houses. But I need to tell you up front, this book surpasses even those. This comic is absolutely amazing. Now we're not gonna spread it out like crazy like we did with the Metal Virus. I mean, I got a lot to talk about, but I am gonna be a little bit briefer in terms of plot summary. Honestly, there's not a whole lot going on in terms of plot in any of these stories, but the moment-to-moment -moment banter, jokes, art, easter eggs, all of it really stands on its own, and if you are a fan of the classic era of Sonic, and I mean that in any aspect of classic Sonic, and you somehow have not read this yet, then you need to stop watching this video and track it down for yourself. This is essential Sonic reading. But hopefully you have read it and you just like hearing me talk about it. We're going to start with brief summaries of the backup stories. Let's kick it off with Amy's new hobby, the free comic book day story, and the one that's included in the trade paperback of the deluxe edition. This story focuses on Amy Rose. Tails pops by for some cookies and tea and stumbles across some comics made by Amy. They are just cute little stories that feature the usual suspects of Sonic and Pals, and we get to see some adorable but well-drawn-out pages filled with references and actually charming character moments, like Knuckles talking about how sometimes it's nice not to be alone. Can your boy analyze a character or what? And this torn out page obviously showing what Sega will never allow. And this adorable walrus who runs a chili dog stand. Is this potentially a reference to Rotor? Uncle Chuck? Both? Whatever the case may be, I love this walrus. He's fantastic and I want him back. Unfortunately, Amy is very clearly self-conscious about showing all of this off to Tails. And I gotta say, I love that this subtly shows the friendship and trust between these two characters specifically, as we don't get to see it too often. And it goes even 
even further to show that Tails knows Amy well enough to know when she's holding herself back by hiding all of her wonderful works away for nobody else to see. So, he takes it upon himself to take her comic and head out the front door to show Mighty and Ray. And before long, everyone else is gathered around to check out Amy's comics, to see how she interpreted them and their stories, eventually including Sonic himself. And yes, it's as pleasant and as heartwarming as you would expect. The more I think about this story, the more I love it. Ever since Mania showed up, I feel like a lot of the creators of the comics and animated shorts have been trying really hard to define the personality of classic Amy Rose. Her characterization has always been a touchy subject, but classic Amy specifically, at least here in the West, has never really had a whole lot going on for her outside of being girl hedgehog who likes boy hedgehog. And while her infatuation with Sonic is still very much intact, there is more here, and I am glad they aren't ashamed of her feelings for Sonic. And Gator Jesus help me if my heart didn't just melt when she saw that Sonic wanted to read her comic. The story feels like it's coming from a personal place. I certainly can't speak of what it's like to be a little girl, but the emotions this conveys feels like this was written by someone who genuinely understands what Amy is feeling. And I certainly can relate to being a kid who's afraid to share their drawings with the rest of the world. So that hit home for me. It's a simple feel-good story, but bless its heart for doing so much with the little time it has. It makes me genuinely excited to see more classic Amy, which is something I never cared about as a kid. And at the end of this story, they reference another story they already told, that being Eggman's birthday. This was actually the story that ties up that original 30th anniversary comic. So yes, we are working backwards, but again, we'll keep it brief. This was the perfect closer for the special, as it focuses not only on Robotnik, but a lot of his classic badniks, something I have not seen since the early, early days of Archie, and something I realized I really kind of missed. I like these robots having their own personalities. This does feel like a classic Archie backup story. All the story really does is follow Eggman as he starts his day and realizes it's his birthday and he begins to dread presents from his robots and when he doesn't see them anywhere he expects a surprise party and then tries to track him down and then he realizes that they went out to capture Sonic as a present and he just stops them before they get themselves damaged. It's quite precious. I love that Robotnik is completely annoyed at the idea of birthdays or getting presents or a surprise party all from robots that he built himself and these robots oh my god I can't handle how precious they are. The Turtleoid? I can't, I can't, I can't handle. I can't handle how much I love him. Oh my god. The big one's only the little. Oh my god, I love it. While this comic is celebrating Sonic's birthday, this story is here to remind you that it's Robotniks as well. And when you think about it, it is a little sad that Eggman needs to build his own family. And technically, I think most of them have little animal stuff inside them, but don't think about it. We're just, we're not gonna think about it. There's one more backup story, which again, when it comes to plot, doesn't have a great deal going on. This is all about Sonic taking a driving test. That's really all there is to it. The story focuses completely on Sonic and his driving instructor. That being said, the story is hysterical and is filled top to bottom with super obscure Easter eggs. It even looks and feels like it came straight out of the original Sonic manga. And yes, of course, there are references to that as well as other deep cuts. And I mean like, Scrap Sonic Extreme deep cuts. This thing is crazy. Half the fun is pouring over all this gorgeous art and playing I Spy with all of this stuff. See how much you can get right and then go back and check out Sonic Toast video, which covers most of the references. And yes, I said most, even in that comprehensive video, there was some other stuff that we were privy to after the artist made a blog post detailing what was left out and what had to be changed. It's crazy. But like I said, that's only half the fun. The other half is the dot dialogue between Sonic and Kip the Capybara, who if you told me was a resurfaced character scrapped way back in the day, I'd probably believe you. But no, he's brand new, he just is designed beautifully. <laughs> and he plays the straight man to bounce off the carefree and talkative Sonic. And every joke that you could possibly imagine when it comes to Sonic driving a car is probably addressed in the script, and it's just a lot of fun. But yeah, that's all I'm really gonna say about that story. I really don't want to read off the jokes or point out all the references, we'll be here all day. And really, if that doesn't entice you to read it, nothing will. 
Now, on to the main story, Seasons of Chaos. This is the big one. This is the bulk of the special. And while it is, again, light on actual plot, there is still a lot happening, and it somehow manages to juggle this massive cast without breaking a sweat. Where the Metal Virus arc could be made for a compelling game in terms of plot and mechanics for, like, an adventure or boost-styled modern Sonic game, Seasons of Chaos would work wonderfully not just as a classic story, but as a classic game. It keeps the tone light, and fun and funny, all showing off plenty of things that make you go, oh man, I wish that was in a game. Like a creative high stakes end boss battle, or a beautiful fall themed zone with a shuttle loop made out of leaves that falls as Sonic runs through, or this fun ice slide, or a level in Bad Nix themed entirely around nights into dreams. Speaking of the nights level, this actually represents spring, and the rest of the zones we make our way through in this adventure represent different seasons. And the story wastes no time jumping into the adventure, as just halfway down the the page, the trio of Sonic, Tails, and Amy find a Chaos Emerald sitting on a flower, but before they can pick it up, Metal Sonic pops by and nabs it. Weirdly uninterested in challenging Sonic to a race. A little strange, but Sonic and crew take chase after the robot, with Amy launching Little Boy Blue after Metal once he goes airborne. Unfortunately, again, Metal is focused on the task in hand and blasts out of reach, leaving Sonic to plummet down to the planet below. But he's not worried about it as he fully expects a rescue from his buddy Tails, but in Instead, he's caught by Knuckles. And remember, this is written by someone who understands that Knuckles is supposed to be on Angel Island. And Sonic, in turn, wants to know why Knuckles is so far away from home. So, Nux catches them up. While he was hanging out in Mushroom Hill, one of the little animals found a Chaos Emerald. And just like Sonic's crew, it was swiped from right under his nose by a robot. So has he been chasing Metal Sonic this whole time? No! No, he hasn't! As it turns out, the Emerald was nabbed by me! Little Knuckles! That's right, baby! He's back! Our boy's back! Oh, stop everything! Are you kidding? No, we're stopping. We're just, we're talking about him for a minute. Are you kidding me? Look at him. Look how beautiful he is. And he's accurate. They're not basing this off a low poly model anymore. This guy has details. I just, oh God, I'm so happy. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm not kidding. We're going to talk about this thing for a minute. Ian Flynn has explained that this design is based off official artwork back from Sonic R. Something that amazingly has not been done before. The public has never seen that artwork as desperate as I am for it. Even in his Archie appearance. Like I said, they based that design off the low poly in-game model from Sonic R. This one is based off the official design. They use actual artwork to sculpt this boy. Now where that artwork is remains a mystery. They released an expensive ass Sonic art book and they still couldn't bother to show it in there. But whatever. I'm happy to finally see this because we finally have all the details showing off the official design. But then again, when I think about it, now that I see this up close, these details match Richard Elson's Sonic R art that he made for Sonic Media a little while back. And yeah, back then I had a sneaking suspicion that might have included details for the bot we had not been privy to prior to that point, but now thanks to this, we have full confirmation. This is what Metal Knuckles is supposed to look like. And I guess as such, back in my Metal Knuckles video, and I thought I got a lot right from the little I could work off of, but I must admit, I wasn't spot on with everything, and some of these details I'm not the biggest fan of here. I'm talking specifically about about the hinged dreadlocks instead of those layered plates I suggested in my video, which we kind of see something like that in the chibi rendition of Metal Knuckles' head that we see later on in this comic. Something more solid like that. I, I like that look better. That's more of what I expected. And the arms themselves, back in that Metal Knuckles video, I compared them more to War Greymon spiked shield gauntlet like things. Turns out they don't exactly look like that. They're actually kind of segmented, which still looks fine, just I was a little off from there. And looks like I was correct about the downward facing vent on the chest, but I had not anticipated that jet booty. That does look a little weird. Again, referencing my Metal Knuckles video, if it was up to me, I probably would have utilized the dreadlocks as jet exhaust and helped the robot maneuver around a battlefield. I thought that made more sense. Still, this original model has a jet going low, which means that it's going to avoid blasting the dreadlocks, which I always thought potentially was a problem when looking at the vent in the Sonic R model. So I'm glad they at least thought that through. In terms of my own imagined interpretations, I can just draw that for myself from Mecha Knuckles design. And you know, if you're interested in that, just let me know. I'd love an excuse to draw some more. And I apologize for derailing this much, but if you've been on this channel for a minute, you probably should have anticipated I was going to lose my mind when I saw this robot again. And 
God, with such clarity. It really needs to be said, the artwork is about as perfect as a classic Sonic fan could ever hope for. This looks like official Japanese game art from back in the day, all while keeping the spirit of Mania, the OVA, and other classic sources alive and well, all while popping beautifully off the page, providing stellar detail, expressive characters, kinetic action. It's absolutely stunning. If this is the last we ever see of Metal Knuckles, I will be satisfied because this art, while it may not be the original official art, is as close as we probably ever will get. And who knows, maybe it's even better. This is crisp. This is beautiful. That said, I hope it's not the last we see of any of this or of this artist. This is beautiful. But anyway, back to the plot at hand. Once Knuckles catches Sonic up with everything that happened with him, they set off after the robots and after the Chaos Emeralds, unfortunately leaving poor Amy behind, which leaves her a little bummed out, asking how is she supposed to prove herself if she's never given the chance? Wow, Amy. How was that from Meta? Damn. Also, the Tails doll is here and being thoroughly creepy as he stalks and records a little girl. Remember, kids, check your toys for cameras. They're always watching. We'll get back to Tails doll. Obviously, I'm excited that he's here too, but I kind of used up all my excitement juice on Metal Knuckles. And I mean, with him being here, you kind of expect a Tails doll. Still, we'll get back to him. From here, the story smartly splits between two groups. One, of course, being the triple threat of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, and the other being Amy and two other characters making their IDW debut. Mighty and Ray. Probably expected at this point thanks to Mania Plus, but I am not complaining. It's so nice to see them here. And if this works as canon, this is technically the first time Amy has met Mighty and Ray as they introduce each other and realize they're all mutual friends of Sonic. And from there, Amy manages to recruit them on the quest to track down the other Chaos Emeralds. Meanwhile, the Sonic heroes come face to face with Bean, Bark, and Fang. Yes, that's right. The comic puts its foot down on one of the alarmingly many name debates in this franchise. Knack the Weasel is going by his original Japanese name, Fang the Sniper. Or you could just do like my boy Cirrus does and call him Fang the Knackle. Best of both worlds in my opinion. So these guys have been hired by Eggman to track down the Emeralds. So of course, these two groups tangle. And for any of you Archie fans worried they'd radically change up the personalities of these three, have no fear. They are true to what's already been established and I'd go so far to say they're even further refined. This is all done by the same writer who worked on them back in the Archie days after all. Neck the Fangle clearly has an old school cartoon gangster lean this time as that's clearly detailed in his dialogue. Bark remains mute and powerful but even without a voice thanks to Amy we do see that there's more going on for that big lug. And Bean while not as crazy as he was in Archie is still crazy and thankfully nowhere near as obnoxious. I'm glad that's been reined in. Not doing a bunch of weird Deadpool fourth wall nonsense anymore. Well, I say that, but there is the slightest hint of a fourth wall break, as Bean mentions that this is his big reunion with Sonic. Now, in this universe, it's clear that these two have met before, so that works just fine within context. But I'd be damn surprised if there wasn't at least a little nod to Bean apparently being completely self-aware of all the real-world comic shenanigans. Considering that it was Ian Flynn who helped define that personality when he first was introduced to our Archie and is now working on this? I'm sorry, there's no way from all these other references and easter eggs that there wasn't at least a subtle nod to that. And I for one appreciate it. And while we are talking characterization, can I just say that the core four are absolutely perfect? Amy I've already detailed and yes she is still great here. There's a sense of innocence similar to Cream but not as sugary sweet as the rabbit could be, which thank god. I'm sorry Cream fans but she, she just is a bit much sometimes. <laughs> And in a world without Shadow, this Knuckles cranks up the stoic, serious nature. And he's also a little less of an idiot, which is a nice change of pace. I don't mind him being a dummy, but this dude is self-assured and focused on the tasks at hand, and is literal to the point that you could compare him to Drax, and I find it quite charming. Now you do see some of that hot-headed nature, or being subtly empathetic to the point where it could be detrimental, but only hints of it. I just, they just did Knuckles so right in this comic, I, I love it. 
Tails is the plucky young sidekick who gets to show off his smarts in fun ways in this fight in particular. First being enamored with the machine doing something cool, even though he's supposed to fight it, he can't help but let his inner engineer geek out a little bit, but then a few panels later, he's completely screwing up said machine with a little rewiring. It's hard to screw up Tails. He's adorable, he's smart, and everyone likes him. And Sonic, my goodness gracious, this is the Sonic I know and love, and I cannot believe how long it's taken to see him distilled down to a balance between being impatient, slightly rude, and kind of a sassy brat, but also being the hero we know and love. Yeah, again, he is sassy, but it's not overbearing, and it doesn't clash against his heroism or his love of his friends. It's a fine line to balance, but it's the kind of confidence you can't help but gravitate towards. You can't help but like the guy a little bit. Even if you kind of want to punch him in the face, you still like being in his company. And you can see that deep connection between Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, all while able to kind of see the origins of their relationships without ever needing to be told their stories. Tails is clearly the kid brother type to Sonic, and Knuckles, being such a drastically different personality compared to Sonic, has probably butt heads with the dude at some point, but now they know how to play off each other. And you get all that just with the conversations between these guys. There's a history and familiarity between them, and it's all done without referencing old adventures or nonsense like that. It's just good character writing, bravo. But yeah, all these dumb dumbs clash, but unfortunately the Yellow Emerald falls off a cliff, so with that goes their need to fight. So the Hooligans and Team Sonic part ways, but hilariously, the Yellow Emerald didn't fall far, it actually landed on Mighty's head. As it turns out, Group 3 was nearby all along. Once again, all three groups go off on their own and we get to see fun little things here and there, but eventually they all converge not just on each other, but also on Dr. Eggman, who has been chasing Metal Sonic. But once Sonic grounds the good doctor and the rest of the team catch up, it's time for some explaining. Why did Eggman hire the hooligans if he was also going to have the Metal team go after the Emeralds? And why is Metal Sonic constantly running off instead of Racing Sonic. Well, as it turns out, Eggman thought it was a good idea to rebuild Heavy King, one of the big bad bots from Sonic Mania who ended up rebelling against the good doctor at the end of that game. And he does it again once Eggman rebuilds him, as King decided he could run the Eggman Empire a little better and took control of Eggie's robots and had him booted out. It was Heavy King who sent out the medals to track down the emeralds. And between that and spying with the Tails doll, it looks like he has retrieved all of them. So everybody puts their differences aside and Sonic and Fang shake hands, agreeing that it's best to tackle this problem as a team. And this might be the first time we've seen these two work together. I don't know, but it's a lot of fun to see all of these characters, Eggman included, work together to take back his base. We see them go through another fun little adventure through a winter themed zone. And as they reach the front doors of Eggman's fortress, they're confronted by Metal Sonic and Metal Knuckles, who put up one hell of a fight, not just against Sonic and Knuckles, but the entire crew. Meanwhile, the Tails doll flops onto the Eggmobile and freaks the hell out of the real Tails and Eggman. And I love that once again, Tails is frustrated that he doesn't get his own robot. He gets this weird, cute little doll. And I also love the, I just love the Tails doll. The internet really played up the creep factor of this doll. And then Archie played into that, I think a little too much in my opinion. But here, while he is built up to be a creep and does indeed scare the crap out of Eggman, at the end of the day, he's just a doll with an antenna. That's it. All he can do is flop. He can't actually fight. But he's not without his uses, as Eggman uses that antenna to boost a signal that puts the metals back in his control. But yeah, outside of that, the Tails doll does absolutely nothing. Just flops about the rest of the story. And I'm here for it. How is this thing not an actual doll I can buy? I'm sick of the Tails plushes actually looking like Tails. Give me that early 90s Acme Mario level of quality for my doll. Give me that Sega Land Sydney kind of design. Just give me an ugly tail stall. Sega, you've given me enough bad Sonic games. Just give me one bad Tails doll. I swear to God, if we finally get Tails doll merch and it just ends up being an action figure. I mean, I'll buy it, but I just, just make a damn plush. Anyway, now the medals and the doll are recruited in the fight against the Heavy King. And while the cast is stacked against him, remember, the robot has all seven Chaos Emeralds. And he puts Sonic and his friends through one hell of a fight. And I just, I love this because this does play out like a Sonic game where things can be light and fun and goofy, but there is still a genuine threat with the end game battle. It's just ugh, really well done. And you know what? Another deviation for a second here. This only just hit me while reading this comic again. Flynn does a fantastic
fantastic job with the Sonic Ensemble, making their abilities and personalities easy to identify and justify in a story. I rarely see any redundant characters when he's writing a big cast like this, even when you have the likes of Eggman and the Heavy King. I love that classic Eggman here is a bit of a bumbling oaf, who doesn't always seem to have a grasp on just how horrifically efficient his creations can be, as we can see with the Metals and Heavy King. And yes, while a robot overthrowing their silly creator is a fairly common trope, I still love the juxtaposition of Eggman as opposed to the more diabolical, serious Heavy King, who actually reminds me a lot of the Sad AM version of Robotnik. I don't know how I managed to miss that all this time. Now, we're probably never gonna see Sad AM Robotnik ever again, and trying to get that actual character into the world of the more streamlined canon that we seem to have these days, I, I don't think that's ever gonna happen. But still, they took the elements that made that particular character so engaging and placed it on Heavy King, and I think that's kind of brilliant. And this works because Sad AM Robotnik and Classic Eggman are two very different characters. And I feel like I'm kind of seen both of those personalities on display here and it's just a treat and seriously if you wanted mike pollock and jim cummings working on the same sonic project together this is how you do it they are both national treasures i need to hear them use those characters against each other anyway while heavy does show off a great deal of power he seems to be no match for sonic's mouth who just keeps sassing the guy. Even though Heavy is fully aware of Sonic's plan of distraction, the Hedgehog still gets under his skin. Or, uh, plates. I don't know. He keeps talking crap, but it's the comparison to Super Mecha Sonic of all things that sets off the king. Also, yes, I gotta appreciate the reference even if I don't get to see my precious Sonic Terminator. Oh, well. I'm glad we can at least acknowledge it. Hopefully we'll see him in the future somewhere. But yeah, with that, the rest of the cast nabs the Emeralds, leaving Heavy King defenseless at the feet of Eggman, who looks like he's gonna mess him up or deactivate him, but instead, after a little kiss-assing, Eggman just ends up complimenting the king because he's just so proud of how well he built the thing. But he does say that he is going to do a software update so that doesn't happen again, so, you know. I genuinely hope we do see more of the heavies. I think they could potentially be great reoccurring enemies. But yeah, Eggy being Eggy, he immediately turns on the rest of the cast and sends his robots to attack. Unfortunately, everybody's already left. <laughs> and the Metals can't give chase because they've drained all of their energy with everything that's been going on. And the Badniks can't be recruited because all of them have been destroyed on their way to the base. So not really anything Eggman can do. The rest of the cast decide to go their own separate ways, each watching one of the Emeralds. Even the Hooligans get one. I mean, I guess that's only fair considering all the help they provided. I mean, they're not the nicest guys in the world, but you know, they're here for the cash. They're in it for the job more than anything else. It's nice to see a little gray in these cute, colorful characters. And we do get a little bit of closure with Amy after being bailed on and everybody apologizes and even Sonic agrees not to do that again. And everybody parts ways in good spirits. And yeah, that's it. That wraps up the special. This book is deceptively simple. We had a lot to pick apart here, but I barely scratched the surface. I skipped over a lot of my favorite little moments between characters, amazing jokes, and I could be here all day if I listed off the Easter eggs. This thing is packed to the brim with love for the classic side of the franchise. And quite frankly, this might be the greatest Sonic comic book I have ever read in my life. This is just about everything a classic Sonic fan could ever ask for. We don't get everything. We don't get the Freedom Fighters or Marco Sonic. And this is indeed a stark contrast from what a lot of fans want in terms of why they fell in love with the franchise. I'm speaking specifically of the adventure games, the later boost games, or, you know, even the wild deviations of Archie or stuff like that. But I'm not going to waste a lot of time placating those opinions. I'm glad all those other bits of the franchise exist. I'm speaking purely as a fan of the classic series. And if you're mad that this just exists, that's your own problem. I don't care. I am a classic Sonic fan first and foremost, and this book makes me damn proud to be a classic Sonic fan. And it gives yet another example of why this rendition of the characters deserve to exist. Do I like modern Sonic and more serious stories? Yeah, obviously. And between this and the Metal Virus, this may be the most compelling argument to have a separate classic universe and modern universe to tell different kinds of Sonic stories. This is, to me, like Mania, one of the most confident Sonic products I have seen in recent years. It not only knows what it wants to be, but somehow manages to refine all these disparate elements from the early days. We have adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog's humor, the intimidating presence of Sad AM's Robotnik with Heavy King, the quirkiness of the manga, even the layout of early Archie Sonic. All of it 
finally with a cast and world clearly inspired by the video games, clearly made by people who know and love the source material, which has been a major issue for me as a kid trying to experience something outside of the games. I have a different point of view nowadays, but I can tell you as a child, I was not happy with the comics or the cartoons because they seem to have zero interest in the source material. This comic feels like it not only celebrates the games, but brings in all the other early media and uses elements that made them shine to refine this whole comic book. And even in comparison to Sonic Mega Drive, which was yet another classic adventure, the core cast and pacing are even further refined from that book. I was constantly smiling at all these interactions and references, genuinely laughing at jokes, thrilled with the action on display, floored by the art. This is everything I ever wanted in a Sonic comic book. This is to Sonic Comics what Mania was to the games, going back to the roots and polishing it up to remind everybody why this franchise was so deeply loved in the early days. That's not the only thing I want Sonic to be. Rather, I hope Sega keeps learning the right lessons and understands that the classic stuff stands out proudly when in the hands of the right talent. If anything, I would like to see this kind of love given to all aspects of the Sonic franchise. Give this love to the adventure fans, to boost fans. It can all work together. There's no reason we can't all have quality stuff that we love. But specifically about this, this comic shows me yet again there's something worthwhile if you just give this a chance. And I genuinely hope that they continue to refine and show off this branch of Sonic. Sonic. Don't shove him into more boost games, let him be his own thing, and give it to people that like writing this stuff. I just, man, this is one of the most perfect Sonic comic books I've ever read. I feel like I've waited my whole life for this one comic. It feels like Sonic has been distilled down to a science, confident in its identity and proud of its presentation. Something Sonic has always deserved. I loved it. Go read it for yourself. If nothing else, it's a nice palate cleanser after the emotional toll of the metal virus. But yes, guys, Guys, that's going to do it for this episode of Sonic Speed Reading. Like I said, we are going to take a little break from IDW. There is plenty to talk about there, but we're going to give it a little more time. And I am going to cover a couple of video games. There's a lot of stuff that's been coming out that I really want to talk about. And Sonic Colors Ultimate's right around the corner. And we have some Saturn games to get to. There's a lot on the docket. So expect more games from the game apologist. I apologize. <laughs> but we will be back to the comics. And when we do, we're finally going to be covering some of the Archie stuff. So I hope you stick around for that because it gets crazy. But until then, I need to give a massive thank you for all the help from the patrons who've been supporting me. And an extra special shout out to these folks here. Joseph Duncan, Sonic 2 Blue, Basie Boar, Jeremy Singer, Kyle Winter, John Hatsworth, Trey Nobles, Nick S, Dun Dun, Dwight Graham, Rain, Fish Flop, The Bad Pal, Mr. SP, Miles the Prower, Stephanie Fon Plakonica. I don't know how to say your name, man. Tell me how to say your name. Anyway, Sam Webster, Mr. Bouje, Cecil the Gallade, Lucas Lipker, Missing No, Three Monic, Ram J. Hall Audio, Leonard Zex, 64 Bits, Beanie, Jamie Chevalier, got it right that time, Lederick, Wayne is Boss, Shodan, and David 20 Covers. Again, if you've heard your name and I said it incorrectly, please message me on Patreon. I would love to get this right. You guys deserve that much much for spending this much money to support this silly ass thing I do. I cannot thank you enough for the help here, guys. I seriously can't. Of course, I cannot go without saying thank you for the rest of the folks who are supporting me that you're seeing on screen right now. If you're not seeing your name on this screen, please be sure you are checking the patron roles. I just recently updated those and Patreon doesn't allow me to change the roles for you because I know there are some folks that are spending enough that they would get a shout out at the end of a video and that hasn't happened yet. So be sure you've done that for yourself or you get your name showing up on here because again, now that there's roles, not every name shows up if it's not assigned to something. And I want to be sure everybody gets recognized because you guys are absolutely incredible. Now for the Patreon pitch, if you do want to support me, I do have some perks that I'm trying more and more to accomplish here. We're going to be doing more community focused stuff like that. I have a lot of fun talking with you guys and I'm hoping to be more and more involved as things continue to grow. If you want to keep updated with everything that's going on, please be sure you follow me on Twitter. I spend a lot of time updating that. That's usually one of the first
first spots I go to, as well as my Discord, no apologies. And we'll have the links for all of that down below. There is a Facebook page, but admittingly, guys, I know there are messages every now and then. I'm just not super quick on getting to Facebook. So I apologize if you've been messaging me there. I'm not super quick on getting back to you. Joseph, you've been here for a million years, man. And I feel terrible when I go as long as I do without messaging you back. So just know where I'm at, guys, because not hard to find. But yeah, that was a surprisingly long episode. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again to Skillshare for once again sponsoring the video. Do not forget about the link in the description. Again, it really helps me out. And I genuinely appreciate the support of this sponsor. But yeah, that's going to do it for me, guys. Until next time, toot toot, Sonic Warriors.